Well, good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome to uh, By the Numbers, a look at uh, uh, evaluating how China and Taiwan perform in country indexes. Uh, welcome to everybody who's joining us here today in person and to those of you who are joining us online. My name is Andrew Wilson, and I'm the executive director of the Center for International Private Enterprise here in Washington, D.C. And it's really my pleasure to introduce uh, this afternoon's interesting panel. Because this is a unique event in, uh, in my experience in Washington, as we've got some really uh, important institutions sharing the same stage. We've got the World Bank, Freedom House, the Heritage Foundation, the Atlantic Council, and finally my own organization, SIPE, sitting at one table. And I think this represents both the importance and seriousness of the topic we're looking at today. That's trying to understand the nature of prosperity uh, and its relation to governance in China and Taiwan. Each of these institutions here today is pushing it in its own way for better governance, increased social and economic inclusion, and a healthier and wealthier world. You know, last week I was in Taipei, and I had the pleasure of meeting a very high-level member of the Taiwanese government, and she related to me her feeling that Taiwan's success in the semiconductor world could have only happened because it was a well-governed democracy. I also happened to meet with lots of major industrialists in the country, and they reinforced the idea and agreed that Taiwan's system of governance provided the rule of law, intellectual freedom, and social flexibility to innovate, grow, and promote investment. They were also clear in their sentiment that such conditions did not exist in China to the same extent, much to its disadvantage. Now, while those opinions were subjective, the import, it's important to note that this event today is focused on the numbers we can see coming out of both China and Taiwan. This panel is not operating on feelings like my colleagues in Taiwan were, but data to every extent possible. And as noted in the financial press, including the Financial Times and elsewhere, the number and quality of economic data coming out of China is getting scarcer due to new data security requirements. This lack of data is making all of our jobs more difficult, especially for those of us who want to engage in a good faith analysis of what's going on. Opacity brings about misunderstandings and miscalculations about intent <laughs> and direction of policy and economies. Communication, not misinformation, must regain the upper hand in dialogue and analysis on so many issues but especially those around China and Taiwan. And each of our institutions here today on stage is committed to engaging in a good faith dialogue on issues at the intersections of markets and democracy. So I'm looking forward to hearing from them today, I, uh, especially their observations and the conclusions that we might be able to draw as a group from them. So once again, I want to thank you and welcome you for joining us. And it's now my pleasure to turn things over to David Schulman who's the Senior Director of the Global China Hub at the Atlantic Council, who will guide us through today's discussions. David? Great. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be moderating this event today. Um, I think we couldn't be having an event like this at a more perfect time, uh, just on the heels of China concluding its 20th Party Congress, which, as I'm sure you all know, is the once every five years all-important political event in China, uh, and this year uh, we marked Xi Jinping only deepening and centralizing further uh, his control over the Chinese party state, um, and now he has power really that is unrivaled uh, since, since the times of Mao Zedong. Um, but I think what is less commented on is that uh, Xi Jinping's work report, which the General Secretary of the Chinese Communist Party gives traditionally at the beginning of every party congress, really underscored that China is going to stick to the path that we've seen China following under Xi Jinping thus far. Um, and that's unfortunate, because what that means is uh, that China is going to continue doubling down on its statist approach, both to the economy and to political repression inside China. Uh, no signs of a repeal uh, of China's very strict zero COVID policies, which have contributed to repression as well as to slowing growth in China. And at the same time, Xi Jinping was reiterating hardline policies toward Taiwan uh, about the need to drive toward so-called pe peaceful reunific re reunification, excuse me, with Taiwan, including using force if needed uh, to achieve that end, and stressing more than before the opposition to foreign interference in the Taiwan issue. And I think we can interpret that fairly broadly. Uh, Xi Jinping has many concerns about stepped up US and international support 
for Taiwan and what it could mean in the event of a crisis in Taiwan and the Strait. But one of those concerns is undoubtedly the growing affinity for and calls for deeper ties with Taiwan in the United States, in Europe, and elsewhere, based partly on the fact that at a time when the PRC is sadly going in the wrong direction and is an increasingly pr uh, promoting a vision of a tech-enabled means for liberal leaders to better control and censor and repress their own people, Taiwan is offering a vision of a thriving and prosperous Chinese democracy with a government that is a leader in using technology to bolster government effectiveness and its capacity to deliver for its own citizens. And this is a really stark difference, and I think it's one that China does not come out looking good uh, in the comparison between the two. But happily, uh, as Andrew just said, uh, you don't have to take my or anyone's word for it. Uh, we have data. And the beauty of today's event is that we're looking at data-driven quantitative measures to compare how China and Taiwan deliver for their own citizens. Now, some out there are going to prefer one index to another. Um, they're going to quibble, potentially, with the nature of the methodologies used in some of these indexes. But that's the point of an event like this, right, is to have opportunities for the authors of these indexes to present their findings, to explain their approach, um, and to offer opportunities for the audience to probe and to ask questions about how we got to these conclusions. So we're going to allow ample time uh, at the end for audience questions uh, at the second half of the event. Uh, but before we get to that, uh, I'm going to introduce this, this excellent panel that we have and then turn it over to each of them to offer initial remarks. So first, uh, I'll introduce Sarah Cook, uh, who's research director for China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan at Freedom House. She directs the Beijing's Global Media Influence Project, oversees the China Media Bulletin, and has been the author of Country Reports for Freedom House's annual publications, including Freedom in the World, and was part of the team that created the Freedom on the Net Index. We also have, uh, to my left here, Anthony Kim. Uh, he's a research fellow and editor of the Index of Economic Freedom at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, he focuses on a range of foreign policy issues, including those related to economic freedom, entrepreneurship, and investment. Taya Trumbick is the manager of the Women, Business, and the Law Project at the World Bank. Eric Hantz leads the Center for Accountable Investment at the Center for International Private Enterprise, which consolidates SIPE's work on corrosive and constructive capital worldwide. And last but not least, Dan Negrea leads the Freedom and Prosperity Center at the Atlantic Council, which produces Freedom and Prosperity Indexes that we'll discuss today. Uh, so now I'll turn it over to Sarah uh, to offer her uh, initial remarks. Thanks, Dave, and thanks, everyone. Can you all hear me okay? Okay, great. Well, I apologize that I couldn't be there in person, um, but it looks like there's a nice little setup where I kind of virtually seem to be on stage next to Dan there, so that's pretty good. Um, uh, as I'll start, you know, in my time today, I'll do two things. One is just introduce Freedom in the World, um, which is the main index uh, assessing political rights and civil liberties that Freedom House produces every year and then dive into some of the numbers on China and Taiwan, as Dan mentioned. Um, so as many of you know, Freedom House is a US-based nonprofit, and we're, you know, we're dedicated to promoting democracy, human rights, and freedom around the world through a combination of analysis, advocacy, and support for frontline human rights defenders. And I, of course, work on our research team. So what is Freedom in the World? Well, Freedom in the World is Freedom House's annual assessment of political rights and civil liberties, and it's really global. It assesses 195 countries and 15 territories, and it's actually been doing that for almost 50 years. Next year is going to be the 50th anniversary. Um, the report is composed of both numerical ratings, which I'll focus on, but also descriptive texts that explain the, the, the reasons for the particular scores that a country receives on a certain indicator. So you can find those on our website. And the methodology is derived in large part from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But freedom in the world, I think a lot of people think of it as assessing governments. It's actually very much focused on the real world rights and freedoms enjoyed by individuals within that territory. So obviously governments play a role in that, but so do non-state actors within a particular territory, as well as of course, you know, foreign governments or foreign actors from outside. So what do we look at, look at? Well, there are eight categories divided into political rights and civil liberties. Under political rights, each country is assessed for under indicators for electoral process, political pluralism and participation, and the functioning of government, including transparency and accountability for corruption. Under civil liberties, we look at freedom of expression and belief, 
associational and organizational rights, including labor rights, the rule of law, and personal autonomy and individual rights, including women's rights. In total, there are 25 indicators, and each one is worth a maximum of four points, so you get a nice neat score out of 100. Um, the way we do our, our, our collected data is maybe, I think, different from some other surveys in that it's not so much, it's not really a survey per se, it's based on expert analysis. We have expert analysts, many of them located in the countries, assessing, providing a preliminary assessment using a combination of on the ground research, consultations with local contacts, and other available information from both governmental and non governmental sources. And then we have an extensive review process using other expert advisors and regional specialists in terms of going through and finalizing the numbers each year. So how did China and Taiwan perform? Well, Freedom House, and I had to go back through some of the historical data myself for this, and it's very interesting, but we've assessed both China and Taiwan since the indexes start in 1973. And, you know, for those familiar, back then both were rated not free. Um, but the trajectory soon started diverging. By 1976, Taiwan had already transitioned to be rated partly free, and since 1996, it's been rated free. Today, and you really see this in the data, Taiwan is one of the freest countries in Asia and even in the world. It scores a 94 out of 100 points, alongside countries like Iceland, Estonia, and Germany. For context, the U.S. scores only an 83 out of 100, so Taiwan is doing better than us. Uh, China, by contrast, is one of the least free. It scores a mere nine points out of 100, and of course is rated not free. But what you, when you look at the data from the past 15 years, you really see that divergence between the two and how it's widened. Because China's score has dropped eight points since 2007, and Taiwan's has increased by five. So China, about a little over a decade ago, was already at a 17 out of 100, which is pretty bad. You know, if you kid got that score in school, you wouldn't be too happy with that. And it's, it was already deeply repressive, and it's dropped almost by half. And so I think that's also, and I think we'll probably hear from some of the folks talking about the business environment, is something that's been very palpable. I just wanted to say a few words about Hong Kong and then some of the implications. So, and I did not know this. We've actually been assessing Hong Kong as a territory since the 1970s as well, um, first under British and then PRC control. And throughout this period, Hong Kong has been rated as partly free. Um, it has a particularly low score in political rights because of the lack of universal suffrage and increasingly strong CCP influence, but it long retained a pretty strong score on civil liberties. That's changed in the past 15 years and particularly the past five. Hong Kong's total score has dropped 24 points since 2007, and 18 of those have been in the past five years. It's now around, a little less than half, around a 43, and very close to being designated not free for the first time. So what a few thoughts and implications, and I'll wrap up, because I know there's a lot still to talk about. Um, as you can see from this data, and I think from a lot of other observations, China is ruled by a profoundly authoritarian regime one that has become more restrictive and less respective, respectful of citizens' rights over the past decade, even as its global influence has expanded. And so we now face a situation, an unprecedented one, where the world's second largest economy is governed by one of its most authoritarian regimes. The situation on Hong Kong has shown a new set of challenges when you look at the dramatic backsliding there. Taiwan, by contrast, has emerged as a beacon of democracy and freedom despite its international isolation and exclusion from the United Nations. Taiwanese civil society, lawyers, journalists, and policymakers have taken serious and genuine measures to expand and protect political rights and civil liberties, despite fierce political polarization, economic reprisals from China, and a barrage of disinformation campaigns from the PRC. And actually, I'm working on another index and a new project that I direct called Beijing's Global Media Influence, whose report we published in September. And we looked at the way in which Beijing was influencing media in 30 countries. We included Taiwan in that set. Not surprisingly, Taiwan emerged as facing the highest degree of CCP influence efforts, but also the highest score for resilience and response. And I think that outcome alone can really offer inspiration and hope as the world grapples with the challenges posed by the increasingly repressive rule of the Communist Party in China. Thank you, everyone. Great, thank you, Sarah. Uh, Anthony, maybe we'll turn it over to you.
Thank you, David. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Anthony Kim. I'm truly delighted to be here with you all today. I mean, what a fantastic five independent organizations coming together to talk about important subject. Um, the Heritage Foundation, we've been uh, producing this annual Index of Economic Freedom since 1995. So it's not just an annual exercise to put together numbers and all that. By the way, today's theme, this title of the event is By the Numbers. I'm not here, given my given seven minutes, I'm not here to torture you with the numbers. <laughs> I want to share, I want to possibly entertain with some thoughts, and we're going to have uh, some you know, action. Why? Because when you come to the Heritage Foundation next time, you will see our vision statement. We want to build an America where freedom, opportunity, prosperity, and civil society flourish. I'll repeat, freedom, opportunity, prosperity, and civil society. I think this is why we are here together. This is why these five independent organizations in Washington, D.C., were kind of united. We also want to build Taiwan or Ghana or Ukraine where freedom, opportunity, prosperity, and civil society flourish. That's the key frame. That's the key concept we want to promote through this annual Index of Economic Freedom. You see wonderful index covers over the years. And we cover four major areas of policy discussion. Rule of law, regulatory efficiency, open markets, and limited government. Under these four pillars, we delve into specific variable, as you can see here, property rights to labor freedom to financial freedom. All 12 components are equally, equally weighted so that we don't bias towards one dimension or the other. I highlighted earlier the rule of law but because nowadays, more than ever, the rule of law is more important than ever. But in our index methodology, we do not differentiate the importance of rule of law against some other factors and pillars. I just want to show you the, the country coverage here. So this is a directly from our index book. And as you can see, we have a many countries. We have from Singapore down to North Korea. These are the countries we grade uh, in our annual index of economic freedom. This is uh, 177 countries, sovereign countries. We used to cover and rank Hong Kong, but in our view, Hong Kong is not a country anymore, not a territory. This is a city of China. So there is no independent policy making, whether political or economic, and we dropped to Hong Kong two years ago to reflect that reality. But you may wonder why then economic freedom? Why, why is it matter? We talked about political freedom, thanks to Sarah, but now when we talk about economic freedom, what's the utility of economic freedom, you may ask? So I just want to share some simple charts here. As you can see, economic freedom is not some abstract concept. This is a, something very meaningful, very powerful. If you look at the relationship between economic freedom and GDP per capita, prosperity, you see high positive correlation. Also, if you look at the change, the change, the economic freedom increases, gross rate comes well as well. So China, despite its shortcomings and all that, if you look at the China's economic trajectory over the past 20 decades, 20 years, you will see bit by bit China has been growing. But the key question becomes how can they sustain that without really bringing real institutional reform? So what we are trying to do is not really rocket science. We want to try best available proxy for our discussion, conversation based on real information, factual information. This is another dimension, the importance of economic freedom and some other independent variable. Nowadays, we talk about ESG, environmental issues, climate change. If you are really interested in ESG and you know, environmental climate change you know, challenges, we have to focus on how to improve economic freedom because that is the engine of innovation. Without innovation, how can we take care of the environment? How can we be really a resilient economy? And this is another dimension. If you're talking about education, health, and also uh, the overall uh, per capita GDP in terms of prosperity, you see definitely high correlation. So this is not really one dimensional financial means or economic life. Economic freedom is really about overall well-being when it comes down to education, access, life expectancy, and health, and even political freedom. There's a high correlation between economic freedom and political freedom. Now I'm coming back to this uh, chart, the ranking or performance chart we have. From Singapore number one down to North Korea 177, because I wanted to show the distance between China and Taiwan. 
I cannot even put together these two countries together. So you see Taiwan, number six in the world. China down there, 158. I have to cut down the remaining countries below to see the, the, the distance between Taiwan and China. But why? It's the same people. It's not far from each other. Taiwan is a very small country, right? And China big, but the difference is very, very concrete and measurable. Because Taiwan is open, transparent, accountable. It adopts freedom, policies based on freedom, openness. Ta uh, China, unfortunately, they are not really doing that. They are just playing, toying with the concept of uh, free trade, it's been one-way approach, and that's why we see this huge difference when it comes down to ratings concerning economic freedom. Taiwan is number six, and uh, China is 154. As you can see, the 80.1 80 .1 versus square 48 is quite a difference. Now, more visually, I just want to show you why Taiwan and China, they are so different. Here, green color or yellowish, they are relatively okay color. Dark green is good color. Look at China, a lot of red. It's not because of their, the color of their flag. I mean, look at the rule of law, basically. The institutional shortcomings. I mean, this is not something we can help. This has to come from China. And we only hope that people in China, they have opportunity to demand greater accountability and transparency, openness. But as we know, as of last week, President Xi Jinping is a king of Xi Jinping now because he has solidified his power based on his royalist and many other things. So that's an unfortunate reality. And again, this is not a political statement. As you can see, all the publicly available numbers, if you put together, you see this stark difference, contrast between Taiwan and China. Taiwan minus China in a simple mathematical terms, that's freedom. And as we can tell, more than any time in our history, freedom matters. And that's why we're going to keep continuing this uh, publication. Uh, next year's will be our 29th edition of the index. We are so happy that our message can be amplified by other organizations like Atlantic Council, Saib, World Bank, and many others, obviously Freedom House. So to me, this is just a one-time discussion item. Obviously, we're going to have a great, great, uh, greater challenges. We're going to have to continue to work together, but this is really time to work together among like-minded, willing partners. So I'm excited, and that's the direction we want to head together. Last but not least, if you're really interested in numbers, and again, I told you I'm not going to torture you, so <laughs> just come to the Harris Foundation website. You can get all the data from the our, our, our index website. So we'll continue the discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Anthony, and uh, I think a lot to dig into there in the in the discussion. So I hope the audience is already thinking of, of questions. Uh, Taya, over to you. Thank you, David. Uh, shifting gears a little bit, um, we're going to talk now about women's rights as prescribed by the law. It is critical to ensure that the business environment treats women on equal footing with men. In fact, after many years of research, we know that a regulatory environment that encourages and incentivizes women's economic participation can have a great benefit for economic and development outcomes. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the World Bank's Women Business and the Law Report, which has been producing data for the last 12 years, but we created an index four years ago, and I'll tell you a little bit about it and how China and Taiwan perform on this index. So a little bit about what we measure. For more than a decade, we have set out to identify where exactly laws are preventing women from starting businesses and contributing to their economies. The project started in 2008 as part of a wider World Bank effort to increase and deepen the research on how investment and regulatory investment climate impacts women. What we found was that many barriers that women face are actually happened before their point of actually starting a business. And this is why we decided to produce this unique index which focuses on a woman's interaction with the law as, it, as she enters, progresses, and ends her career. The unit of measure here is a woman, and the eight indicators that you see on this slide follow how the law impacts women at different stages of her working life. As she enters the workforce, um, her rights in the workplace, laws that mandate women's pay, what happens when women get married, have children, all the way to when they retire. What we found in our research that it's important to, to understand how the law treats women as both employees and entrepreneurs, and also within the private sphere of their life. The, their freedom of movement, 
within their country and internationally, and also their ability to remain in the workforce after they get married and have children. Some of the late, this is from the, our latest report, which came out last March. We found that the global average in the world is 76.5 out of 100, meaning that women on average have three quarters of the rights of men. But this global average hides a lot of variation both between regions and within regions. And every line you see here is a country within this region and its score. The two regions that are furthest behind are Middle East and North Africa and South Asia, followed by Sub-Saharan Africa and East Asia and the Pacific. And there's a lot of work to be done to advance gender equality uh, in all of these countries. In 86 countries, women face some form of legal job restriction shutting them out of many high-paying jobs, such as in transport, manufacturing, construction, water, energy, or mining. And even if they can do the same jobs as men, in 95 countries, women are not guaranteed equal pay. We hope that this report will accelerate progress towards this important area. It's shocking that in 2022, we still have so many discriminatory laws that are preventing women from equally participating in their economies. But to turn to the topic of today's discussion, which is China, you see here the orange circles are China's score on, on the overall index and in each of the indicators, compared to the East Asia and Pacific region and the global average. As you can see, in some of the indicators, China achieves a perfect score of 100 over 100. These eight indicators, behind them are 35 questions grouped to about four or five questions per each indicator. And you see where there's the most room to improve is on women's pay and women's pension. Currently, there is no law mandating equal remuneration for work of equal value in China. And also, women cannot work in the same jobs and industries as men. In particular, they cannot work in mining or water industry. When it comes to pension, the, the ages are unequal at which men and women can and must retire. And the, and the difference is quite large. Women must retire at 50 and men at 60. Now, women often take time off because of having children from the workforce, and then if they also have to retire later, the period of that they work is much smaller. If they're also paid less, then that leaves them in a very financial, financially difficult situation, and they tend to live longer. So we see a lot more women poor at an older age because of this. We also find that um, people are not really promoted as they near retirement. So if women are retiring at 50, their progression within their careers is also is also slowed down. So these are the two areas where there's really the most room to improve, equalizing retirement ages and reducing the number of restrictions on women's work. When it comes to Taiwan, um, the picture looks much better. The overall score is 91.3, and eight, uh, six of the eight indicators achieve a perfect score. Where, but there is still some room to improve, and that is related to parenthood, um, also in entrepreneurship and pension. In Taiwan, uh, the employer bears the full cost of maternity benefits, which can sometimes be a disincentive for employers to, to hire women, and that's the area where they can improve. Um, they also do not prohibit discrimination based on gender when it comes to access to finance. And when it comes to retirement, um, years taken for child, to take care of children are not accounted for in, the pensionable, in their pensions. Now, there are only 12 countries in our index that score 100 out of 100, and that means that there's 178 countries where women are not treated equally in the law. That leaves 2.4 billion women that don't have equal opportunities to participate in their economies and contribute to the growth of their, of their countries. Uh, we did a big research effort a few years ago to recalculate our index all the way back to 1970, looking at the laws that we could find. And this allows us not only to see where countries stand today, but how they have progressed over the last 50 years. And as you can see from this chart, there has been progress everywhere, but it has been very slow and very uneven. Uh, you see a big shift both in Taiwan and China in the late 90s and early 2000s. But for the last seven or eight years, there have been no reforms at all in this sphere. And overall, the global average, as I said, has, has increased from 45.6 in 1970 to 76.5. But this is a very slow pace for 50 years, and these issues are not really controversial. They're about giving women equal opportunities to participate in the economy. And so we hope that the data um, and, the re and the evidence and the research that we have will help make the case for those working in these countries to really accelerate the pace of reform. <coughs> if you'd like to download our, our dissemination package, you can scan this QR code 
Uh, on our website, we have data for, and underlying data for all of, our, our, all, of, all of the countries. We also have evidence and analysis that links this index to outcomes that really matter for both human rights and economic development. Thank you. Thanks, Taya. Um, I think, you know, I, I'm struck as you were talking by the fact that we come out of this party congress in China with a Politburo uh, in China that's now made up of 24 men, no woman on the Politburo, first time since 1997. Wow. And then, of course, in contrast, you know, in the theme of this event today with, with President Tsai Ing-wen uh, leading, leading Taiwan. So maybe when we get into the conversation, we can talk about the implications of that for, you know, the kind of the leadership of countries and what that means for equality, uh, gender equality in countries. Uh, Eric, over to you. Thanks, uh, and happy to be here today. <clears throat> Share the stage with such uh, great institutional partners and colleagues here uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, I think that SIPE's uh, index might be the newest on the block here. <clears throat> SIPE has been working at the intersection of, of markets and democracies for the past 40 years. Uh, and our primary constituents are working with chambers of commerce, business associations, and economic think tanks throughout the world on business reform issues, uh, making economies more inclusive uh, and deliver uh, more accountable ways for more, more citizens. Uh, this corruption risk forecast is the product of a close collaboration with the Hardy School uh, in Berlin, uh, and we've developed uh, this uh, over the past uh, more than a year uh, to essentially use data in a way to project outward. Uh, so this has two primary audiences. Uh, the first audience being an academic audience or a practitioner audience uh, in the anti-corruption sector that is looking to improve governance, uh, but in new and, and different ways. Uh, the second audience is for businesses, businesses that are looking to invest in fixed capital investments, long-term investments, uh, and to take a look at the historical trend lines uh, in order to project out uh, and see what to expect uh, down the line. Uh, using the uh, cor corruption risk forecast, we have 30 different indicators uh, grouped into these indices and a forecast. The index of public integrity, uh, it assesses the capacity to control corruption and ensure that public resources are spent with integrity. Uh, unfortunately, for both China and Taiwan, due to uh, certain gaps in open, gov open government partnerships, uh, reporting metrics, we are not able to produce a fully robust uh, IPI, or Index of Public Integrity, for either country. So this is uh, a, a gap that we do hope that both China and Taiwan uh, address in the future. Uh, we also have a Transparency Index, which is looking at uh, government transparency based on different kinds of public information and services the country to offer their citizens, uh, both de jure and de facto uh, um, uh, sets of transparency. And within the corruption risk forecast, you'll actually see links to each uh, of the indicators. So if there is a public land cadaster, uh, there'll be a link to that within the, the corruption risk forecast. Uh, if there is a system of public uh, uh, declaration of judgments, uh, there'll be links to that within the, the corruption risk forecast as well. Um, all of this produces and flows into the corruption risk forecast, which is built uh, into objective indicators uh, looking at uh, a period from 2008 uh, through 2020, uh, which is the last uh, full set of data that we have. COVID has interrupted uh, the data collection and we hope to get more data and fill in the index as we go forward. Um, so again, who is responsible? We're here at SIPE, uh, here in Washington, D.C., uh, and also the European Research Center for Anti-Corruption and State Building. Uh, this is based out of the Hurdy School in Berlin and it's a team of researchers uh, that is really uh, looking at anti-corruption practitioners and focusing on how they might uh, change the dialogue around anti-corruption programming. So moving beyond naming and shaming or public governance reform and into new and innovative models to fight corruption and improve transparency and accountability uh, around uh, public finances and private investment. Now, if we look at a uh, comparison between China and Taiwan, with the Transparency Index, we can see here that we forecast that China will be stationary over the next uh, several years, uh, that it ranks in a middling manner uh, within Asia, uh, and we compare that with Taiwan, uh, which has uh, a, an improving uh, transparency trend uh, and more publicly available data to more people. Uh, we project out uh, that this will allow, public cit allow citizens in Taiwan to better assess the responsibility and accountability of their government, allow civil society to have more of a voice in the process, 
uh, and holds public governance, uh, public uh, stewards of public finances more accountable. If we then go to the corruption forecast, uh, looking at uh, China and Taiwan, we see China as a middling, again, uh, 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 country uh, where they uh, are not uh, really moving forward or backward. Again, if you look down in the lower right-hand quadrant here, uh, we don't have a lot of data to rely on when we're making this corruption risk forecast. Again, this is a dearth of data uh, coming out of Taiwan, and it's, it's only, or coming out of China, and it's only getting worse. Uh, if we look to Taiwan, we have a number of data points to, uh, to uh, look at uh, on judicial independence and press freedom. Press freedom is, is kind of middling, but judicial independence is moving forward. Uh, and we do think that uh, corruption uh, is on the downward trend and accountability and transparency metrics within Taiwan will allow the country uh, and the civil society to hold public officials more accountable moving forward. So uh, the last point here, where, where is the data? Uh, and with China in particular, uh, when I was putting this presentation together, it, it's really difficult to pull a lot of, uh, a lot of the public uh, data because there is just none. Uh, we're, we see the public data becoming increasingly scarce. I pulled up a, a recent uh, Financial Times article uh, that indicates uh, that uh, publicly available data on the economy is on a downward trend. We see from uh, Xi Jinping's remarks at the recent comment, the recent uh, um, committee meeting that uh, security is now in the driver's seat over economic performance. And we see a divergence between Taiwan and China, where Taiwan is disclosing more and more information, allowing for greater government, account government accountability, while, Taiwan is, er, while China is closing down uh, and we see a greater uh, reluctance to disclose any data. Uh, and really, this is a test, uh, to my mind, uh, for markets and transparency. Uh, so we have uh, within China now certain data that is restricted due to security concerns and SOEs which may have access to that data. And we have a private sector within China that due to those security concerns does not have access. And as, as uh, Drucker uh, once said famously, that if you can't, uh, you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Uh, and so now we have a private sector uh, that's producing microchips or chicken sandwiches. And if I don't have access to data uh, to forecast where my business will go, where I need to invest, at what point in time in the production process I need to put, put that capital, how am I going to invest uh, and create uh, greater wealth and greater opportunity within China? So these are some big questions that we see coming out. Uh, we look forward at SIP to hosting an event at the International Anti-Corruption Conference here in December. Uh, and uh, we do have a forthcoming paper on Hong Kong after the investment security law, which should be released within the next couple weeks. Uh, within that paper, uh, not to give any, any spoilers, uh, we do find that, uh, that Hong Kong, uh, after the security law, uh, has had uh, a significant decline in international capital uh, and is acting more as a window for China to get out into the world rather than for international investors to come into China. So the, the, the um, flow has indeed reversed. And with that, I will stop. Great, thanks Eric. I think that point about opacity and the difficulty of getting data is, is probably relevant to, to everyone here in terms of their, their measurements and their indexes. So maybe we'll come back to that uh, point as well in the discussion. Um, Dan, over to you. Um, thank you, David. So I'm Dan Negre. I'm represent the Atlantic Council. We have a freedom and uh, we have a freedom index and the prosperity index. And I would like to start by thanking SIP um, uh, uh, and uh, being co-organizer with us. Um, thank you very much, Andrew, for your opening remarks. I enjoyed very much working with Eric here, and and I see Greg in the audience. We have great plans to work together. And I also want to thank representatives of. Um, of great indexes which helped our indexes get going. So uh, if you pick up the report, and there are reports at the, uh, at the, uh, on the outside, at the table at the, at the exit there. By the way, we are getting paid by the piece, so if you <laughs> buy those things, it would be great. It will help us. Um, you will see in the acknowledgment section that we uh, give thanks uh, to Heritage 
and to Anthony by name, actually, and his boss, Jim Carafano. We are thanking Freedom House. Uh, Amy Slipowitz, Sarah, you're getting thanked by proxy. Um, and at the World Bank, uh, Thea is, is mentioned by name and four other of her colleagues. So what we've built, we've built in partnership with the other indexes, we are not competing. We are here on the same, on the same mission to get facts and discuss, uh, discuss facts and figures. Um, what are we going to do today? We are going to, um, to dis I'm going to provide the dis a description of the Freedom and Prosperity Indexes. We'll talk about the results for China and Taiwan specifically, and uh, we'll have a broader perspective of the results that uh, we are showing. So we have, two, we have two indexes, Freedom Index and the Prosperity Index. The Freedom and Prosperity Center at the Atlantic Council is dedicated to the exploration of the question of the relationship between freedom and prosperity. And we heard Anthony talk about how in, in his index, he looks at the results of his index and he creates correlations with different things. Where we decided to create a complete index that captures some of those things. So then we look at the, at the relationship between these two, these two indexes. So the Freedom Index um, has three sub-indexes. Uh, we have a freedom, um, uh, a political freedom index, where we are uh, analyzing some of the same things that Freedom House's Freedom Index is, analyzes, but in less detail, less depth. Um, and we have several sources of, of the data, Freedom House World Justice um, uh, Project among them. We have an economic freedom sub-index in which we look at some of the same things that, that as Heritage, and we have some of our data from Heritage, the World Bank Group, Fraser, and the Credendo Group. The one thing that we did that we, are, um, we find very productive in this discussion is to create something that we call the Legal Freedom Index, where we are looking at judicial effectiveness, state capacity, order, and securities, things of that sort. It's not, it's legal freedom, it's not um, justice. We are not looking, we're looking here at the institutions of a country. Is there soundness in how the economic freedom and political freedom is being administered? And here we have a variety of sources also, including Freedom House, World Justice Project, Fund for Peace, etc. And then we have a prosperity index. What we thought was very, very important was to uh, measure more than GDP per capita. We think it's very important to define prosperity broadly. We do measure income, but we also measure the environment. We measure health. We measure happiness. We think people should be happy. <laughs> and we also measure um, minority rights. Uh, and for, for some of these things, we have proxies that are um, more or less perfect because everyone who works with indexes knows that you can have the greatest intention to, of what you want to measure, but you also need to be realistic in, do you have for a certain indicator, a hundred and data for 174 countries and for a number of years? So we are measuring 15 years going back for 174 countries. So these are the two um, indexes that we created. We have sub-indexes, indicators, we collect the numbers, and then we create a score. And with the score, we put countries in categories. So here we are showing you the prosperity index. We, we were intimidated that Freedom House is here, so we didn't show the Freedom Index, which of course yours would be much more complex and famous and all that. So we divide countries in, 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 in the Freedom Index, free, free, mostly free, mostly unfree, and unfree in prosperity, prosperous, mostly prosperous, mostly unprosperous. So we, we have that, and then we have also a rank. And then we have a map and the same hierarchy of colors um, showing uh, countries in the different categories. So now let's, let's look at China. So what are we seeing at China? we see for China is that for the Freedom Index and for the Prosperity Index, China is in the 
using our categories, uh, where we go 100 to 75 is free or prosperous, 75 to 50, 50 to, so it's by, by the score. Using these categories in the indexes, China is mostly unfree, second category from the bottom, and mostly unprosperous. Um, but I would propose uh, to also look at the rank. So if you take 174 countries divided by four and you end up with quartiles for this, you will see that in terms of uh, freedom in total, um, China is in the bottom category among the countries of the world, sorry, not the bottom category, the bottom quartile. Economic freedom, bottom quartile, political freedom, bottom quartile. Legal freedom, it, it is in the second from the top, right? Second quartile. In legal freedom, again, we measure the strength of the institutions. They rank very well, for example, in order and security. In the prosperity index, the overall rank uh, puts China in the um, third quartile at 114. In income, it's in the second from the top. In environment, second from the top. Let me add to uh, this on environment. We all hear about lots of pollution in China. The way we measure uh, environment is using uh, quality of the water, using a measurement from NASA as a proxy. This is a very basic measurement. So on that, China is doing well. Um, we'll come back to minority rights. On health, it is in the second from the top. And in happiness, it's about middling. The one uh, measurement in which China ranks extremely poorly out of 174 countries, 167, it is minority rights, which measures, uh, uh, which measures religious freedom. Uh, not surprising, uh, given the treatment of uh, the Uyghur minority. Now, looking at uh, Taiwan, it looks very pretty, sort of like a mint leaf, you know, <laughs> peppermint leaf, very pretty. Okay, so whichever way you cut it, it's in the top category. If you look at our, um, our categories, free, mostly free, etc., or if you look at quartiles, dividing 174 by four, um, it is free. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, correction. It is mostly prosperous. If you look at the score for um, the prosperity score, it is 73. Uh, it almost made it in the top category. The, the, the cutting level was 75. Um, um, so it is at the very top of the second category. But in uh, freedom, top category for economic freedom, political freedom, legal freedom, um, in political freedom is number eight in the world, according to our measurements in minority rights, stark contrast to communist China, it ranks number four in the world. Um, but let me tell you this about our index. We, um, it was easy for us to find correlation. So our correlation between the freedom index and the prosperity index is 0.81, which is about as high as you want to be because if you are at one, it means you're measuring the same thing <laughs> on both sides, and then what's the point of having a measurement, right? So, but we are very, very interested in figuring out the direction of causation. We are exploring the question of does freedom lead to prosperity? Do you need to be free to be prosperous? That's what we are really interested in our work. So one thing that we decided to do to test this to look, is to look at discontinuity moments in history and to, 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 uh, to see how countries who were in one point in such a moment, how they performed from there. So we looked at East and West Germany, uh, North and South Korea, and uh, the PRC, Taiwan, and Hong Kong over time. So if you look at the East and West Germany um, analysis, what we did was we looked at, at, 19, uh, at 1950. All of Germany had been devastated by the war. 
you had two countries, East and West Germany, that had a, 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 a difference between the GDP per capita of the two countries of 1.5 times. And then there was the discontinuity. West Germany became democratic and capitalist, and East Germany was ruled by the Communist Party of East Germany from 1950 to the reunification of Germany in 1990. By the time of the reunification, the discrepancy between the GDP per capita of the two parts of Germany was 3.6 times. If you go to the right, we have North and South Korea. They both were very poor at the end of the Second World War. For a while, they were both autocratic. In North Korea, you had the communist government. In South Korea, you had the military dictatorship. But South Korea was capitalist. So democracy started in South Korea in 1980. So by 1980, the, the delta between GDP per capita of the two was 2.7 times. So after 1980, uh, South Korea was both capitalist and democratic, and today the difference between the two of them is 51 times. So let's look at China. GNI per capita this time. You'll notice GDP, GNI. We do this just to keep you on your toes to make sure you pay attention. If it's the same thing, then you get you know, bored and don't pay attention. You don't read. Okay, so GNI per capita. Mao era, end of the Second World War, a poor country, and it stayed poor for a long time in the Mao years. Then in 1980, you have the, the Deng Xiaoping reforms, and they start catching steam. And then you have this tremendous success that we all know and admire with China. But it could have been a lot better. If you look at uh, Taiwan and Hong Kong, you see that Hong Kong and Taiwan grew much faster especially after 1973 when Taiwan became democratic. And as, you, as was discussed before, there were always elements of democracy um, um, in, in Hong Kong. One more interesting thing. Um, I'm, I'm talking about, I'm, I'm praising the World Bank only because Thea is here, otherwise <laughs> I wouldn't say. So economists at the, at the World Bank came up with a very interesting concept that we here refer to very often as the middle income trap. So what they define by that is it started with an observation that a lot of countries over the decades were able to move from the low income category to the mil middle income cat category, but didn't make it over the hurdle to the high income category. It looks they looked as if they were trapped in the middle income category. So therefore, the term middle income trap, which sounds very ominous, but it, it's just that. So if you look, and, and every year the World Bank tells you what that level is, and they measure it by, by GNI per capita. And today, it is 13,205. And guess what? China has not gotten out of the middle income trap today. But if you look in history, you will notice that Hong Kong escaped it in the 70s, and Taiwan escaped it in the 80s. So what does this all mean? Um, I want to be very careful with the terminology. I'm not here to present you any definitive proof of the direction of causality. But we can say that our work indicates that free countries tend to be more prosperous than unfree countries. And again, let me remind you, because I was talking actually with David before on the definition of prosperity, it's not GDP per capita the way we look at it. We have a broad definition, a holistic view beyond just wealth. We think about prosperity as the well-being in a society. Is this a society that creates conditions for human flourishing? Is this a country in which people want to live? And if you look at that, while we recognize the many successes of, of uh, the PRC in increasing its GDP per capita, when we compare their results and the results of free Taiwan 
and partly free Hong Kong, we cannot but wonder how much more the people of China could have accomplished if they had been free without the Cultural Revolution and its re-education camps and without the concentration camps in Xinjiang today. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, I think that's a really important point to kind of end on because I know that a lot of folks probably are thinking as they look at some of these indexes, well, China has, you know, it's the world's second largest economy now, isn't it? Isn't it prosperous? But defining our terms and kind of thinking through what that means is, I think, really, really helpful and can spark some more more debate about about these indexes. So I, I, I thank you for uh, those great presentations. I think five different indexes and a lot of um, different aspects that we can we can dig into now in the conversation. Uh, I'll welcome the audience to to raise their hands if they have questions. But I want to um, start, um, you know, I think kind of where you left us, Dan, and also maybe t for Anthony as well. Um, I noticed that in both of your indexes, uh, Singapore actually does relatively well, right? So in the heritage uh, list, it's, I think, number one in economic freedom. Uh, in, in the uh, Atlantic Council list, it's an authoritarian country, obviously, but one of the most prosperous in the world. So maybe just, you know, w whenever we have this conversation about democracy, authoritarianism, and prosperity and economic success, uh, and whether it makes sense to split the world up uh, as, as the Biden administration arg arguably is doing into democracies, aut autocracies. Singapore is always kind of one of those, those things hanging out there that, that is hard to categorize and deal with, right, in, the, in, that, in that way. So maybe we just open it up um, to, to you, Anthony, if you want to kick things off and then see if anyone else has thoughts on that. Thank you, David. That's one of the, uh, the important yet standard question we often get. By the way, uh, through my snapshot presentation, I wanted to make sure that really what matters is, once again, freedom, opportunity, prosperity, and civil society. They are all interlinked, and that's what we are trying to convey, why these variables, freedom, opportunity, prosperity, and civil society, they are so important in terms of ingredient. When it comes down to Singapore, this is not a lazy excuse, but our index is really about economic dimension. So David, your fundamental question is really, you know, Singapore is quite small, open, global, financial, economic hub, but when it comes down to Singaporean political system, you may say something very different. You know, Singapore is not really a full-blown democracy. Uh, they have their own internal constraint, but again, uh, this is not a, like an excuse we are trying to convey. We intentionally design and build our index focusing on economic freedom side, but when you visit Singapore, you will see the vibrant you know, discussions, civil society dimensions, freedom, opportunity, and prosperity to a really high level. So that's the kind of the, the setting we are. But of course, we can talk about, as Professor Negria mentioned, the relationship between economic freedom and political freedom is undeniable. I mean, the question becomes which one comes first, but without the fundamental pillars of you know, openness, transparency, you know, all civil society functions, we cannot really sustain this uh, symbiotic relationship between political freedom and economic freedom. And I think that Singapore will show a unique example because Singapore is also going through its own kind of internal source searching what will be the future of its political system. So I think we have a real live example mm -hmm. in front of our eyes. Interesting. Dan, go ahead. So, um, David gave me an easy question because we are at the same organization. We're both at the <laughs> Atlantic Council. And the reason why it's easy, it's we discussed this, this, the case of Taiwan in our report of, of last year. Here is where we came out on it. Um, the question is, can a, a country without political freedom maintain economic prosperity? When you introduce the arbitrariness of um, a government that is unelected, and um, by the way, let me let me make this point, which is very important. Until now, I talked about numbers and data. There are no numbers and data here. It's a personal opinion, but it's something that we discussed. Um, the PRC used to grow at 10 percent. It is now projected next year to grow at 4.4 percent. Not all of it, but part of it is, is due to the fact that the, that the economic freedom reforms of Deng Xiaoping are being reversed 
under Xi Jinping. And one of the things that they do is now they put a member of the Communist Party on the board of directors of every company. And introducing a political influence in the, uh, in the economic process. But coming back to Singapore, Singapore doesn't have this. Doesn't have this because the founder of modern Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, was a genius. Uh, Henry Kissinger picked six great people of the 20th century, and Lee Kuan Yew is one of them. So, uh, if you want to bet your country's future on having a genius as your leader time after time after time, good luck. <laughs> also, if you want to ha have an authoritarian system to rule your country, if it's Five million, sort of the size of the large city in the US, you're doing fine. If you have a billion four, I still wonder how Xi Jinping thinks about this. A billion four and one man and makes all the key decisions. Tough to do. So that's where we came out on the Singapore. It introduces the presumption that you are going, to, and by the way, since Lee Kuan Yew, they've had two other prime ministers, excellent. Mm -hmm. But do you bet that you will always have excellent leaders? That's the question. Okay. Uh, that's a good answer. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, my, my, the other kind of overarching question I wanted to ask is, um, these are all very, you know, interesting, useful indexes um, for those who are researchers and those who want to dig into the data and get a, get a better sense of how to make these comparisons. My question would be, what is for each of you the intended audience for these indexes, right? What is it that you hope, who, who is it that you really hope is digging into this and what change potentially do you hope to affect uh, by doing this work? And, and so I'd open that up, up to everyone, but maybe start with those uh, who've kind of uh, had some, some newer indexes. So maybe we could start with you, Eric, since I know your corruption index is relatively new and then uh, turn to anyone else who wants to address that. Yeah, so the, the, I mean, the primary audience that we were thinking of is, is well, two primary audiences. The first audience is anti-corruption practitioners. And so anti-corruption uh, is, a, is a, everywhere within Washington these days and, and in the West in general. Uh, but to this point, it's, it's a lot about naming and shaming. It's about uh, investigative journalism, digging into the data, digging out into individual cases. Uh, and so what, we, what, what our intent was here was to show the system, systemic risks and systemic nature of corruption uh, and to expose governance gaps in order to begin to address them as anti-corruption practitioners. It's really interesting and it's a great story and it's a great read to, to, you know, to read these articles in, in you know, the Atlantic or in the Washington Post or whatever uh, uh, it, news, news uh, source of, of your choice is. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, that's only one small insulated case. What we, our objective here is to look at uh, a systemic risk of corruption and begin to address that through anti-corruption and good governance. Uh, the second audience is really investors. Uh, so investors in the private equity world, investors that are making long-term bets on fixed capital investments that will take a decade to pay off. Mm -hmm. We wanted to give them a snapshot of the direction uh, that nation, nations were taking through their policies and adoption uh, of good governance over a period of more than a decade. Okay. Uh, Sarah, did you want to answer that question? Sure. Since we have a really old index, about a decade and a half old index, and a brand new one. Exactly. So. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I think, I mean, when you look at freedom in the world, it's been around for so long, and I think it has many different audiences, and I think there's also this element, which is, I think, very interesting. You know, there's who uses the individual country assessments and then the interest in the overall global trends, especially when you created the index each year. You can say, look, this is the trajectory of democracy. These are the regions of the world that are, are made and countries where there's progress. And this is where there's backsliding happening. And I think it's those global findings that really get a lot of attention, both for, for, well, for all the indices, for freedom in the world, for freedom on the net, and the new China one we did. Um, so I, I think that's kind of top level to just really inform the public and public debate. I think when you get to like the policymaker level and individual countries, you know, we hear from civil society activists that it can be very helpful for them. I mean, the purpose is that it's research, but it is also, there is that element of galvanizing change. I think trying to point out in particular countries, what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses, 
what are maybe, you know, competition regionally? Ooh, you know, we want to be the top of our region and, oh, we're the best. And there's bragging rights for some governments and others. But we also hear civil society activists using that, you know, being able to go to their government and say, like, look, this is an area that, you know, our score could improve or our score declined. And they say that it can be very helpful to that. I mean, I think the other thing I would say is honestly also how the index gets used. So actually the Millennium Challenge Corporation, for example, a lot of investment firms who do do ESG uh, investments end up using, say, um, you know, as well as fellow indices like, like Dan's new index, um, you know, the data from other indices. But I think with the MCC or investment, then the, the numbers become money. And so we actually have governments reaching out to ask, sometimes less sincerely, sometimes more sincerely, you know, how they can improve their score so that they could be, you know, maybe more eligible for, for an MCC compact for, 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 for foreign assistance funding. Um, and so that kind of in, in terms of that good government's conditionality can be really important when in, in some of these indices are used, um, you know, for either by investors or say by, by donors. Uh, to incentivize uh, better governance. Great. Um, did anyone else want to answer that? Yeah, I can, Taya, come, I can come in. Um, I resonate a lot with, with everything that's been said already. I think, you know, Women, Business, and the Law Index looks at laws, and laws are under the direct purview of governments. So I would say our primary audience is governments or policymakers that can change those laws. Women are half of the world's population, but in 178 countries, they're not treated equally. So this really, there's a lot of a lot of people that can influence that change. So like Sarah said, civil society has used our data in their advocacy. The MCC also uses it in their gender and the economy scorecard. Researchers use it to make stronger cases for gender equality, both um, on human rights grounds, but also on economic grounds. So I think we, we've had lots of different um, audiences using the data, but primary audience is really those that can influence the change and change the laws. Just quickly, I think we're all on the same page, but I want to share something quick. When we were designing and trying to come up with a, our first index back in 1995, we had a very specific policy objective. Back then, foreign assistance was a big thing in Washington, D.C., you know, USAID, helping other countries, kind of giving out money, but we thought that United States foreign policy in terms of assistance can be more effective because ultimately it should be homegrown, it should be bottom up rather than making our friends overseas depend on our U.S. government program. So that was the beginning. And I think that over the past 28 years, I think we've been achieving a lot of things. Not only MCC, but USAID, they are now using our index, for example, for their uh, self-sufficiency, vote for self-sufficiency, and a lot of others are using it. So we didn't have really targeted audience, but it's really good that, like many other uh, partners and organizations we have today, more people are coming to realize this is a really important policy tool, not only in terms of investment, but many other things. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a really a concrete progress we all collectively making. Great. Dan, you want to? So our uh, focus are developing countries. Um, we uh, didn't even want to look at uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, we felt they are doing well enough. Uh, now with the war in Ukraine, we decided to focus on Eastern Europe. What we want to do is we want to give decision makers in developing countries uh, who are in government tools sort of along the lines of, of what Sarah was talking about. We want to make the case that you need freedom to achieve prosperity. And when they say, well, how do I increase freedom? I say, well, you have economic freedom, political freedom, legal freedom. Here are some of the levers that you can move to improve the prosperity of your country. At the same time, we want to give tools also to activists in developing countries. So they can go to their government and they say, look, you are at 132. How about we do a little bit better? So and you can change the following thing. So that's how we are thinking about our audience. Okay. Um, Tay, I want to ask you a question related to what we were uh, kind of mentioned at the beginning, which is uh, the relevance of how a country is led um, and the ability of women to be the leaders of countries and what that means for equality, uh, gender equality in countries, uh, any follow on effects that come from that. Do you see any? correlation there. It's certainly, as I mentioned, kind of uh, relevant to the China-Taiwan conversation, but I'm sure it's relevant uh, to, to what happens in lots of other countries. 
No, absolutely. We see a very positive correlation between countries that legislate equality mm -hmm. and a uh, number of women in leadership positions in politics. We've done that. We did a correlation a couple of years ago with the number of women in parliaments and our index, and we found a very strong positive correlation. Now, we don't know which way the causation goes. Is it when more women are in parliament, they legislate better, or that more equal laws lead to more women being able to get to that place? So we, we don't know enough about that yet, mm -hmm. and I think that's an area of research that really we need to do more on to understand what comes first and what really leads to this change. We have this 50 years of data that shows where change has happened, when, on what, but what we need to understand is what led to those countries focusing on those issues in that particular period of time. So I think some of these other data sources out here that show uh, what happened politically, economically, um, can really help us understand more what motivates change. That's interesting. More, the more information on that, the better, I think. Yeah. Um, Sarah, I wanted to go back to you. I, um, you, you mentioned Freedom House also publishes uh, an annual assessment of internet freedom in several dozen countries. Can you talk a little bit more about how China and Taiwan perform in that space specifically? Um, sure, so um, the Freedom on the Net Index also has a score of say out of 100 and it looks at a number of different areas. One set of scores relates to access to technologies and so there, for example, China does score relatively better in certain ways, but also not as well as you might think in others because of, say, urban rural gaps or other restrictions that are that are placed on connectivity. Um, and then there's limits on content or the way in which content is regulated. Of course, China scores very poorly there. And then the respect or violation of user rights. And China actually has like no points in that section. Mm. So in the on the index for internet freedom. Uh, China scores also only a 10 out of 100, and it was actually ranked as the worst performer of the 70 countries, 70 or 75 countries, um, for the eighth year in a row in the in the version that we just the edition that we just published last year. So I think the Chinese government is has really that's not surprising, but you know been really at the forefront of designing the toolkit and implementing how to suppress internet freedom. Um, and I think has contributed to some of the global declines that we see. But China's last in that set of countries. Taiwan, on the other hand, scores a 79 out of 100. And I, I, had to, I didn't double check, but I'm pretty sure it all, the U.S. is also below it on that one. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then in Taiwan, obviously, it's a very open, free Internet. It's one of the freest in Asia. You do still have on the book some things like criminal defamation and some other criminal penalties for certain online um, you know, online uh, activities. And so that's something that's not really a best practice. And so they, even though there aren't a lot of cases under those laws. And then they lost a point last year for something that was kind of a mistake, but apparently the government blocked a cryptocurrency exchange and news platform. It was then reversed, but in terms of the way the methodology worked, they got docked the point. But last year it was a, it was a flat 70 point difference between China and Taiwan. And so we don't assess Hong Kong there, but I think if we had you would have seen Hong Kong a few years ago much closer to where Taiwan is, and now really rapidly dropping in terms of prosecution, starting to see takedowns and things like that. So I think I think that's one of the spaces also with Hong Kong that that has really deteriorated in the last couple of years. That's great. Yeah, I mean the well, it's not great that it's deteriorating, um, but the 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 data from Freedom on the Net I think is just incredibly valuable, and also looking at the way in which China's model is, is being kind of replicated and being promoted in developing countries around the world. I think um, the fact that Freedom in the Net digs into that is really, really useful. Um, I just want to ask one more question from me uh, for the panel, and then we'll, we'll open up to questions, um, which is, and, and Eric, you kind of touched on this, but the, the information scarcity in these countries, uh, China being a prime example, where you have limited freedom and openness, right? Um, how do you currently, uh, across these different indexes, deal with that when you're looking at countries that are not free? Um, how do you expect to have to deal with it in the future? And then maybe because of where we're holding this, this event at the National Press Club, what is the role of the media um, in trying to push forward? Um, maybe, maybe how, how would you want the media to use these indexes, but also what is the role of the media in, in perhaps ensuring that there's data that you can actually use to continue this important work that you're all doing? Um, so maybe, Eric, I'll start with, with you if you want to add to your comments. Sure, yeah. Um, look, I, I, to have a, a robust market, you need open data. You need, you need access to information. And the security fo first focus of China and what they're doing now is really limiting, li limiting you know, our ability 
to develop this corruption risk forecast in order to deploy it and compare apples to apples. It, you know, again, back to uh, Andrew's opening remarks, we're trying to make a good faith analysis here uh, between uh, two different economies or, or economies within the world. And if we don't have access to that data, if we don't have access to information and uh, like for like uh, metrics, then we aren't able to, to conduct that analysis. And then, you know, you have a, a press uh, that's, you know, being suppressed and that does not uh, uh, have the ability to report on this because many of these uh, indicators are now subject to national security provisions. Mm -hmm. So even if you would report on uh, these, uh, these metrics, uh, then you are subject to criminal penalties, uh, imprisonment, uh, and we do see this being exported. Uh, so we have seen in, in, in our corrosive capital work, uh, state-owned enterprise, state-owned enterprise contracts being subject to national security provisions within the recipient country. So now we have uh, a third country uh, that where journalists cannot really dig into the data uh, on the, the commercial terms of this transaction. And that hurts the overall uh, private sector and the market and, and their ability to react to these investments. Makes sense. Uh, anyone else want to add on that? I'll, I'll just convert this question slightly to a technical kind of question because it's one thing that we produce annual index, but the key question becomes, how do we maintain our credibility and objectivity? I mean, you can just say, I'm playing darts. Okay, China is 25. Taiwan, I love you, so I'll give you 75. <laughs> you know, that's not what we do, obviously. And as a an, you know, Washington-based organization, we cannot possibly travel to each and every one of these 177 countries we cover. We have to come up with a very consistent, objective, reliable way of measuring good governance, especially good economic governance. So we tend to rely on international organizations data, IMF and World Bank, mm -hmm. because they have an important role to play, not only in terms of bailing out or assisting other countries with a foreign aid. Their ultimate goal, in my view, is how to really expose bad practice and enhance transparency in our global economic system. So we rely on their numbers. Obviously, we are the consumer and, and you know, watchers of those international organizations. I think that's a one unique way of really monitoring China as well. I mean, I cannot just you know, wait for China's submission of here's a very nice, tidy economic freedom data you should use. We don't do that. But because of other things we talked about, MCC and other countries, PR dimension, we get a lot of emails and phone calls for a private meeting. But we gently say, we are here to listen to your story, but we cannot really utilize your data because it has to be cross-checked. We have to be consistent for our methodology and everything. So bottom line, it's an important dimension, but I want to highlight that this is really about promoting transparency and good governance, either economic or political, whatever system. That's the focus of this kind of index business in my view. Okay, yeah, I think that's obviously essential to maintaining the legitimacy of these indexes so that it's understood that it truly is based upon that kind of measurement. Yeah. Taya, go ahead. I could answer that question as well. So uh, the Women bus Business and the Law Index is based on the law, as I said. And so what we do, we, we also have local experts in 190 economies, and we ask them to point us to the right laws that then we look at and evaluate. Mm -hmm. So for now, it's just a purely de jure index. We are looking at how to measure practice as well, and for that, there will be more subjectivity around that. Um, but for now, we rely sort of on written rules. Mm -hmm. Um, but we, we also rely on the media to highlight these messages, and every year we have, a, our annual, we have an index that is now annual. We come out every year in March, right before International Women's Day, and we rely on media to amplify these messages and really highlight how slow progress has been in the last few years. Well, I, I don't want to be the only one who doesn't say anything, because then people <laughs> wonder, well, why doesn't he say anything about it? Um, so, we, uh, so we are measuring 28 different indicators and we have 15 different sources of, of data. So sort of along the lines of what Anthony was saying, we, we rely on, on data from sources that we trust and we have a diversity of sources. Thank you.
Can I just add on to that, Dan? How do you measure happiness? I'm very interested. Uh, there is a United Nations uh, measurement. There is, okay. And uh, it's done uh, together with uh, Jeffrey Sachs. I mean, the, the, the creator is Jeffrey Sachs from, from Harvard. Okay. And it's based on interviews in, in, in countries. And uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Sarah, anything to add there or no? No, no, I think it'll be good to leave some time for questions okay. from Okay. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, yes, sir, I think we have a microphone coming to you. I'm uh, Peter Humphrey, an intelligence analyst and a, a former diplomat. Uh, Ms. Cook, uh, can you shed some light on how you deal with the uh, liberal-leaning censorship by the uh, social media oligarchs? which surely has to hurt the U.S. Uh, freedom picture. And secondly, y'all, do does any of you sort of have the courage to do a parallel study on prosperity versus religion, which would shine an equally valid Klieg light on the human condition? Sarah, do you so want to I'll, take that? I'll be honest, I have not looked at the U.S. report that closely. Um, uh, you can find the U.S. report both for Freedom in the World and for uh, Freedom on the Net. Um, I think in some cases uh, there may, I don't know if the score changed or there's certainly mention there of kind of moderation policies of technology companies, whether they're proportionate, whether they're open, whether they're transparent and some of these same principles that we've been talking about. Um, so you can look at that there. And then I would say in terms of the religion question, I mean, freedom of religion is um, one of the indicators that we look at on freedom on, in the world. And in fact, one of the places I think was mentioned here, China does very poorly on, and Taiwan actually has um, a quite diverse and robust um, religion, religion community. Religion. Does anyone else wanna, thanks Sarah. Uh, does anyone else wanna, answer that, the kind of relationship between religion and, uh, and freedom in these indexes? Yeah, I think I'm doing the same thing I'm mentioning. I'm measuring freedom of religion no. as part of prospect. But I would, I would love to talk to you afterwards and understand what you're trying to do because we are looking at prosperity. I'm very interested. So let's have a conversation afterwards. I'm very interested, sir. Thank you for your question. Yeah. But I want to add, though, I think you are raising an important dimension here because to me, Freedom, you know, political freedom, economic freedom, they are the, uh, the input, and prosperity is output. But what you are raising here is, I see religion as one of the input, you know, factor. But if we can have a variable, you know, you, you say religion, but if we have uh, some kind of database that shows 100-something countries, or even less, 70-something country, like a religion-based, some sort of the index, we can have a definitely better answer to your question in terms of the relationship between good governance, either political or economic, and religion. But we don't have that database yet. Yeah, I mean, that gets to one of my questions. I'm curious if anyone wants to answer this, which is, you know, these are, these are difficult endeavors that you're all diving into or have been diving into for a while in the case of, of, of Heritage and, and, and Freedom House and, 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 and also the World Bank. Um, you know, what are the biggest challenges that you face in putting these indexes together? And I, I would say, you know, going forward as you think through where the world is heading, we already talked about the opacity challenge, we've talked about some other challenges. What are some of the, the uh, kind of roadblocks that you, you know, you need to deal with currently and are, are expecting to deal with in the future as you continue to put these indexes together? So the, uh, in what we are trying to do, which is figuring out causality, is, uh, is going back in time because we are now have data for 15 years, but um, we are measuring slow-moving indicators. Uh, health doesn't, the health uh, measurements in, in a country don't change from year to year. Mm -hmm. So we want to look at, as I was saying before, moments of uh, discontinuity. And there are some, some countries, for example, you look at India, it ranks very well on freedom, but doesn't rank well in prosperity. But we believe that if we go into the, the, into the data uh, longer than 15 years, we may see moments in time where there was a change from a more statist approach to the Indian economy 
to a more free enterprise approach to the Indian economy. But we need to go back in, in time. So, so now for next year, we will have data for 25 years comparable. But you need 50 years. So Joseph Lemoine and Yomna Gaffer, who are my colleagues here, um, and, and, and James, we are going to put together a database that is 50 years. And then we can do better work on causality. Okay. Anyone else? We can, we can give you some advice on that because we did that three years ago. We, we looked historically and, and I think the biggest challenge is finding the data. And mm -hmm. I think that was mentioned earlier. Um, for us, you know, we base our index now on the laws, but we know increasingly that practice matters much more than what's on the books. And social norms, which religion can be part of that, uh, really influences the uptake of some of these rights. And so how to influence those and how to understand how those influence legislation is something that we're grappling with right now, how to measure. If I may just quickly, I think, again, we're on the same page, but I must say that we are more interested in what's ahead of us mm -hmm. than what's behind us. So rather than becoming a lagging indicator, we try to be leading indicator, trying to offer some more kind of a, you know, concrete and practical assessment in terms of what's ahead of us, but that's not easy. And also, second portion of that is that, you know, index is not really kind of political tool. This is a policy tool. But over the past years, I think to a certain degree, this kind of index, either heritage index or some others, it has become a political tool in terms of discussion. And also, I have to say, Taya, because I have a tremendous respect for what you are doing, certain indexes has become the victim of political discussion and political kind of uh, football, in a way. Because we need a more transparency, we need a more practical policy tool we can compare and contrast so that we can really bring real changes into countries like China. But obviously the Heritage Foundation, without budget, we cannot do what World Bank is able to do. So echoing your point, I think probably the biggest challenge is how we can continue in a consistent way to secure good data, quality data, I'm not talking about qu quantity. Mm -hmm. We've got to focus on real quality on the assessment and data and thus good discussion. Yeah, question here. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Tina Chong from Voice of America's China branch. My question is uh, to Ms. Uh, uh, Tia. Uh, I'd like to know, uh, because you're talking about good data and quality data, I'm just wondering, because you list uh, Taiwan under China, Taiwan, China. So I, I'm just wondering, since uh, Taiwan is not a member of the World Bank, uh, how do you get quality data uh, from Taiwan? Is it totally separate from China? Uh, I mean, the sources. Thank you. Yes, so our sources are from the private sector. It's professionals in those economies and countries that answer our questionnaires and point us to the laws of their country. And we measure um, the laws that are relevant to the main business city. So we look at Taipei and we look at Shanghai, not the entire country themselves. Um, and the, the source is the actual written law, but sometimes we need to get it from some people in the country. Yeah. Great. Um, we have time probably for one more question, if we have any questions in the audience. Uh, otherwise, uh, I'll turn to our panel to see if anyone has a kind of a final word on, on their index and, and how they think it relates, not just to the China-Taiwan question uh, at this moment where we see China heading more in an authoritarian, even more uh, hardline authoritarian direction and Taiwan uh, seemingly headed in, in the right direction. Any, uh, any final comments or thoughts? Well, I think it... Uh um, I think it's wonderful that these organizations got together to compare notes. And um, uh, I want to propose that we do it again. Um, and we should also add two organizations from Europe, um, Legatum and Bertelsmann, mm -hmm. who have a yet different approach to how this should be done. Um, I think there is a, a very important role for being factual rather than emotional about these things, and we can make our point much, much better by being factual. If I may, I think the reason we are here today is really we want to bring real, measurable, concrete, positive change into China. 
We are not praying for the collapse of China. That will be a disaster. It will be a nightmare. I cannot imagine how we can do things in Indo-Pacific with fragile and chaotic China. China is not a Singapore. It's a big guy. And we got to make sure that we have real tool in terms of transforming China into somebody like Taiwan. So this is the journey we're going to do together. Well, I think that's a good way to close. Uh, <laughs> thank you, everyone, for coming. I want to thank our fantastic uh, panel. And really, as has been said, uh, bringing these five uh, organizations together to, to you know, discuss and compare these indices, I think, has been a really useful exercise. So uh, stay tuned. These indices will continue to produce interesting results. Um, and I think it's been a, a really great conversation this afternoon. So thanks very much, uh, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.